Hi. Today we talk about your subjective experience of time and at the end of the video we'll hit you with something that you'll find mind-boggling. We were wondering how the world would appear if it had multiple dimensions of time. If you missed the earlier videos, no problem. Here's a recap. Let's start with some assumptions. Time and space are discrete, so there is the smallest possible length and the smallest possible time step. The world is deterministic and the same conditions always lead to the same outcomes. You don't have to accept these assumptions, in fact they seem contrary to physics as we know it, where time and space are taken to be continuous, the random quantum effects are observed in a single dimension of time, but just go with it for now. We're interested in exploring the consequences of multiple time dimensions in such a world. Here's our observer. He's about to knock a glass off the table. The main trick to handling multiple time dimensions is to move yourself out of them and looking on from the outside. So we split the world into snapshots of each moment, like in a film strip. Each frame is a space. You can imagine it being simulated on a computer and each space containing all the information about the particles at that time. Instead of calculating the states, we could also just hard-code values for each time step. I would argue that you don't even need a computer, just having the data is enough. If you're uncomfortable with that, let's postpone the argument. You can just imagine a physical freeze frame of the state of the world at each moment, every proton, neutron and electron frozen in each space. Aren't particles in probability clouds, you might ask? Not here. Everything is in a well-defined place. As I said, just go with these assumptions for now and see where they lead. We can tell a time dimension because of the complexity gradient. There are processes that are for statistical reasons practically irreversible. We know that the laws of physics allow the shards of a broken glass to spontaneously reassemble into the glass again and jump back on the table, but we also know that it is so unlikely that in effect it's never going to happen. The sequence we show is just representational. The individual time units are of course very short, so in reality such a sequence would be comprised of many zillions of spaces. What constitutes time in the mind of observers living inside a world? The mind of the observer here is not a mystical entity like soul or spirit, but the processing state of the observer's brain. The observer experiences time by remembering the past and planning the future. The observer can't predict the future with total accuracy because he doesn't have full knowledge of the external environment, but at least the world is predictable enough so he can plan for it to some degree because he understands cause and effect. Does the order of the spaces matter? Not really. The flow of time is not governed by a rule that it must go in a certain direction, but is an emergent phenomenon. It is just how the observers make sense of their memories. If we jumble up the order of the frozen moments, the observer will still experience time and have a memory of the past. What if we mix in a few spaces of other unrelated objects? They don't matter at all if the observer's mind cannot make sense of them. In the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, it is postulated that at every quantum event the entire universe splits into two for unknown reasons. The resulting tree structure provides a neat explanation for the phenomenon of entanglement. Still, many worlds is not widely accepted because of two problems. What is the mechanism that makes the world branch? And it is impossible to verify experimentally because the worlds, once split, never interact. So it doesn't feel like a testable scientific theory. Still, it is easily understood. The concept of the multiverse has now entered pop culture and is being used as a plot device in many movies. It also has some prominent proponents. Here is Stephen Hawking with John Oliver in 2014. You've stated that you believe there could be an infinite number of parallel universes. Does that mean that there is a universe out there where I am smarter than you? Yes, and also a universe where you're funny. I would like to point out that this would imply that everything happens, while I would say that only everything that can possibly happen along the branches of the event tree happens. Everything possible is a lot, but a lot less than everything. Here's the Mandelbrot set, which is always a source of useful analogies. As you zoom in, you find more and more detail. Can we type in some coordinates and find the Mona Lisa in the Mandelbrot set? As we zoom in, we get unlimited detail and more and more complex shapes, but they all look Mandelbrotish, not a Mona Lisa in sight. For our observer, how far do you have to go to be able to consider these sideways versions alternate copies of the same person? 
birth, conception, 18th birthday, at the same generation that corresponds to many years after that date, some of these alternate versions of this person might be quite different from each other, but, not, but clearly not every conceivable variation. Our observer might never be an Olympic gold medalist, but neither a mass murderer. So I'm afraid I have to disagree with Stephen Hawking. There's no guarantee that there is a universe in which John Oliver is funny. We can, however, build a finite world where everything happens. Each of our frozen spaces here is finite, so we can just list all possible combinations. Most will just be noise, but the set will also include every sequence that observers can make sense of. This is not our experience of the world, and we can rule out with a high confidence that the world works like that. We've discovered many irregularities that we call laws of nature, and we use them to make predictions. So instead, what clearly happens is that the state of each space depends on the space of the previous moment. So here, in our linear sequence of spaces, each space is calculated from the previous one all the way back to an initial space. In fact, every point in space doesn't depend on the whole previous space, but just the surrounding points, which we have named predecessors in an earlier video. This implies a maximum propagation speed of one space unit per one unit of time. That means space is expanding with time, and going back to the initial condition, we arrive at a single point. Speed of light and Big Bang notwithstanding, this is not quite our experience of the world either. Quantum physics has shown that the world is not deterministic and that apparently strange things happen at small quantum scales. So what if we have several time dimensions, meaning we calculate the state of each space not by one predecessor space, but by two or three? Our space dimensions x, y, z are mathematically interchangeable. They are distinct from each other, but you can swap them over without effect. For example, there's nothing special that distinguishes the x direction from the y direction. Let's say that the time dimensions are also interchangeable. In our subjective experience, time flows down the steepest complexity gradient, which we've called timeline. With two time dimensions, the timeline is diagonally between the time dimensions. This is the flow of time as it is experienced by the inhabitants of the world. We show it graphically here as a fat arrow, with thin arrows pointing to sideways in time. With three time dimensions, the timeline is diagonally between all three, and there are two sideways in time directions. Three time dimensions match our world better, as discussed in previous videos, but two time dimensions show most of the effects we want to explore and are much easier to depict graphically, so we will go with that for now. Here are some timelines pointing down. We have a particle in a different position in each timeline and an observer in each. When the observer copies don't have information about the particle position, then their mind is in perfect synchronization. We only speak of one mind and show it as a thought bubble shared between the identical physical observer body copies. This means although we see several physical bodies of the observer, they all behave in perfect synchronization with each other, including every neuron in their brains, so they share the same mind state. When they switch on the particle detector and information about the different particle positions reach the observers, then their mind states diverge and each observer copy that until now have shared a common memory each see the particle in a different place. A particle is just a stable pattern in a discrete vector grid. The vectors affect each other from sideways in time. In fact, as you can see, even one time step back each point is affected by only two points to the left and to the right. You have to go back two steps, we call them generations, to find a point at the same space coordinate. An observer's brain is a large complicated structure. The observer has a memory of the past and plans for the future. The difference between consecutive spaces on the observer's timeline has to be small. In previous videos we've used the analogy of a marble rolling down a slope following the steepest path. The effect is that the path of the observer's mind state is a tree. Once the observer's mind has diverged, then it is statistically extremely unlikely that its path will arrive close to the same state again, a bit like the broken glass spontaneously reassembling. This means that the only timelines that an observer can experience are in effect the direct descent down the tree along the dominant timeline diagonally between the time dimensions, but with a small sideways drift possible. Mm, sideways drift? As we've just seen, there's no direct connection on the diagonal, so the observer on average travels down that direction 
but there is a small sideways drift that approximates the Gaussian distribution because the 2D structure looks like a Pascal's triangle. It's a well-known property of Pascal's triangle that the number of paths approximate a Gaussian normal distribution. Let's show this in action with our previous example. Here all the observers share the same mind state because the state of the particle is unknown. When the identical observer copies get information about the position of the particle, then their mind states diverge and each knows the precise location of the particle in their timeline. Note that it's in a different position in each timeline. The observers turn their detector off. Due to the sideways drift, a few observer copies end up on parallel timelines and then they observe that the particle is in a different spot than previously measured. Note that none of the particle copies have moved. Due to the sideways drift, the longer the observer doesn't check the particle position, the more copies of the observers end up on timelines that have drifted sideways. The center of the particle remains in the same position, only the uncertainty of the position spreads out. Also, the center is different in each timeline. Conversely, if the observers frequently check on the position of the particles, then the sideways drift is reset each time because the mind states of the observers re-diverge. What we have discussed so far are logical consequences of multiple time dimensions, but as you will have noticed, they map very nicely to some quantum effects. For example, the last situation is called the quantum Zeno effect. Now, if the observer believes that there is only one time dimension, and that his timeline is the only one, then the observer will think that a particle is a smeared out probability cloud until observed and may be tempted to invent outlandish concepts such as the collapse of the wave function. Here are some physics terms mapped to the phenomena exhibited by a world with multiple time coordinates. Superposition. In a way, the superposition is in the mind states of the observers rather than the particles. Measurement or collapse of the wave function. This is when different information reaches the observer copies and their mind states diverge. Decoherence. We covered this briefly in the first video and called it timeline selection. It will pop up again in future videos, but this one is getting too long. In short, as information about the particle leaks out into the environment, it affects the branches of the tree that the observers can be in. Wave function. This is the hardest concept to map. This is a mathematical description of the neighboring spaces sideways in time. Once again, we will postpone a detailed discussion to a future video. Entanglement. This is a concept that just disappears. As wondrous as spooky action at a distance appears in a single time dimension, this is a non-effect in multiple time dimensions. If we have a process that produces two particles in two different states, and the observer copies don't know which is which, then they share the same mind state. Identifying the state of one particle diverges the mind state and therefore instantaneously determines the state of the other as far away as it might be. No wormholes connecting entangled particles are necessary. Now let's have a closer look at timelines. Here are three time dimensions, Tx, Ty and Tz. The timeline with the steepest complexity gradient, T, is diagonally between them. The timeline T shown here is the one that passes exactly through the origin of Tx, Ty and Tz. There are of course many parallel timelines that have the same complexity gradient. Each of these timelines potentially hosts observers with shared or different mind states. Apart from a small sideways drift, each observer travels down these parallel lines. Here's the question that will blow your mind. Is there a way to deflect a timeline from this diagonal? For example, can you make time flow at an angle like this for an observer? Stop the video if you want to think about it for a bit. You have all the information you need to work it out. So, you can make the time flow at an angle to this dominant diagonal simply by physical movement. Here is a stationary observer. This axis is the space direction, say x, time runs downwards. The complexity gradient in this stationary world is aligned with the time direction t. So far so good. Now we consider a case where we have a closed system moving at speed. Here is the observer in a spaceship. As you can see, if we follow the same timeline straight down as in the stationary picture, where there was the observer's brain, there is now a piece of a rocket. We remember that the flow of time is an emergent phenomenon, so this is the actual timeline T' prime for such a moving system. 
This means that in effect every velocity vector has its own personal timeline. One consequence of this is for systems that are spatially separated, the concept of simultaneity breaks down. Isn't it interesting how this hints at special relativity? It doesn't seem very relative, more like special absolutivity theory, because of our axes. But if two systems are relative to the absolute coordinates, then they are also relative to each other. How do you measure time? With a clock. What is a clock? It's something where you count the vibrations to quantify the passage of time, be it swings of a pendulum or hyperfine transitions of a cesium-133 atom or all the subatomic particles in your body. All phenomena we've discussed so far in this video were consequences of multiple time dimensions. Now let's indulge in a tiny bit of hand waving. We speculated before that massive particles are actually helix-shaped stable patterns in a vector grid, each of them a clock going at some rate. Let's say that they stretch out by the same factor when they move at speed down an inclined timeline t prime. We know it has to be like this because the speed of light is constant in each frame of reference. The effect is that all clocks run slower when compared to systems at rest. This is just a taster. There's lots more to do, like use Pythagoras to derive a Lorentz scaling factor and explain gravity, but those are for other videos. Still, I hope you found this interesting. For my part, I think it's cool that there are several paths leading to multiple time dimensions. Multidimensional time certainly makes special relativity easier to understand. Not having simultaneous events in a single time dimension is brain-bending, but with multiple time dimensions it's logical. On top of that, string theory might also benefit from some extra dimensions. And multidimensional time explains many of the weird quantum effects. At the end of this video series, maybe all of them. Thanks for your attention.